can you hear me? Yes. Is there anybody that needs a little more volume? Okay, that's good. I'm Kathy Speck with the AIDS Historical Society, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to the fourth of our five gallery talks associated with our fabulous exhibit, Real Reality, How the Trains Made Aims. You are surrounded on the outer walls by that exhibit, and if you have not had a chance to browse and learn from the exhibit, I hope that you will stay for a little while after the lecture or come back, because there's a lot to absorb. And of course, across the hall, several wonderful models for you to enjoy. Um, I wanted to thank especially our partners here at the Octagon for their cooperation and, and enthusiasm for helping us to present this very large exhibit to the Ames community on the, on the sesquicentennial of the Union Pacific Railroad. I also want to thank um, some of our sponsors, our grant, uh, grant giving organizations. Brenda, I'm not saying this because you are here, I've said this every time. But we are very grateful to the Union Pacific Foundation for a major grant, also the Alliant Energy Foundation, and the Ames Convention and Visitors Bureau Community Grant Program. So we are very thankful for that extra funding because they really made the difference between doing this show and not being able to do it at all. And as you came in, you noticed some absolutely gorgeous publications that Brenda has provided, uh, Union Pacific Sesquicentennial Mementos, and I see the stack of calendars is quite low. Those are really keepsake calendars with the history of the railroad on each successive page. Now I mentioned the, um, that this is the fourth of five gallery talks. And I want to just make sure that you know we've had all the other talks on the third Tuesday. The last talk is on a Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock. And the reason that we made that change was to accommodate a younger audience. This October 6th um, gallery talk will be a course for all of you adults, but also will be great for kids. So if you have grandkids or know other uh, younger folks, this really is going to be a great talk for them. So uh, make sure that uh, you, are, you have spotted that sort of wrinkle in the schedule that it's a Saturday presentation. But we are very pleased to have Brenda Mainwaring here. Brenda uh, is from Council Bluffs originally. She has her master's and bachelor's, bachelor's and master's from the University of Iowa. She joined the Union Pacific Railroad in 1997 in government affairs and in 2001 moved into a program management <coughs> position. And while she was in that spot, she had the great fun and challenge of developing the Union Pacific Museum in Council Bluffs. So she's very familiar with that particular facility. Have any of you visited the Council Bluffs? You see, all oh, right, now the rest of you must go. <laughs> this is a wonderful, wonderful Let's museum and definitely worth the trip. Right. Okay. And plan plenty of time to go. Uh, another project that Brenda managed was uh, overseeing the Union Pacific's role as a supplier to the 2002 Olympic Winter Games in Salt Lake City. A very interesting experience on that. In September 2007, Brenda was named Director of Public Affairs for Iowa and Nebraska. And in that role, she is responsible for community affairs, government relations, and charitable giving from Clinton, Iowa to Scotts Club, Nebraska. And here she is. I'm going to talk about um, the history of Union Pacific, what we do right now, and what the future is going to look like. And I can talk for a long time about the yeah. road. So I want, I want this to kind of meet your interests. I think there's probably a lot of very knowledgeable people here in this audience. So I encourage you to redirect me with your questions. Um, I'm more than happy to take questions as I'm speaking, and uh, I'll just kind of tell you about what's going on, and then uh, raise your hand and wave it around if I don't notice you. First question has been, what is this train hauling? And I know at least a couple of you know, because I gave you the answer. Anybody else? 
Wind turbines, yes. This is, uh, this is the future of the railroad. It's, these are uh, blades from wind turbines, and anybody who's been stuck behind a caravan <laughs> of a wind turbine on Highway 30 is very glad that we're carrying them on the railroad. Uh, we do a lot of this hauling. It's been kind of interesting getting into that business. It particularly happens to be Logan, Iowa. So as Kathy said, this is the 150th anniversary of Union Pacific. Um, this photo, when I know it, I'll tell you where it is, because I think people are probably interested in this. This is the Dale Creek Bridge in Wyoming. Um, I don't know who was the first guy who was willing to go across this bridge on the train, but I think it took a lot of nerve to do it because this is about the tallest and the longest toothpick bridge that we built in the original uh, Transcontinental Line. So the 150th anniversary, on July 1st, 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Act. And that act created Union Pacific Railroad. We assume that we're the only corporation still existing, maybe the only corporation ever, that was created by President Lincoln and by an act of Congress. We're the only railroad in the U.S., the only major railroad that has retained its name. I can tell you that all of us at Union Pacific take a lot of pride in that, and you can see that with our 150th events. How many of you came out to see the steam locomotive last weekend? Good number. I hope you had a chance to talk to some of the people who are out there, some of our employees, because I know that what you've discovered when you talk to them is that they have a real passion for the history of the railroad. It's been exciting to celebrate that 150th anniversary this year. So, how come Council Bluffs? <coughs> Most of you probably know this history, but when, in 1859, President Lincoln went to, then not president, but he went to Council Bluffs to check on some property that he had been given as part of a settlement of a debt. And he met up with General Dodge. Now back in the 1850s, they didn't exactly campaign for president. Doesn't that sound wonderful? <laughs> <laughs> but they did make their way around the country. And it's pretty clear that one of the reasons that President Lincoln went to Council Bluffs was to talk about the railroad, because the Transcontinental Railroad was a major part of his platform for what he wanted to do if he became president. He talked to Dodge there on the porch of the Pacific Hotel in Council Bluffs, and he said, what's the best route to get west from here? Dodge said, right straight through the Platte Valley. And so after the South seceded and the Pacific Railroad Act finally could go through Congress, because of course it was held up by conflict between North and South about where that route should be, it was signed in 1862, and the next year, Lincoln said that the, the route would start on the west, excuse me, on the east side of the river across from Omaha, Nebraska. Now, the act was funded in part by private donations, but also in part by land grants from the government and by payment for track built. Well, it was going to take a long time to build a bridge. So instead of starting in Council Bluffs, the powers that be at the railroad dug the first shovel of dirt in Omaha. And Union Pacific has been in Omaha ever since. They didn't build a bridge across the Missouri River until the 1870s, and so there wasn't a through route until the 1870s. But after that, it became, in fact, they had to go to the Supreme Court to, uh, to declare that Council Bluffs was indeed the Eastern Terminus. So, so Iowa can always celebrate that fact. <laughs> What also happened, and the reason Iowa has developed the way it did as a railroad state, is because once it became clear that the eastern terminus was going to be in Council Bluffs, every railroad that existed in the east laid track to Council Bluffs. They laid track to Iowa because they knew if any of their passengers wanted to go farther west, for at least some period of time, there was only going to be one way to do that, and it was going to be through Council Bluffs. So Council Bluffs, and Iowa in general, became a huge railroad state. Of course, when uh, Lincoln declared that Council Bluffs was a starting point and he created Union Pacific, they also assigned Central Pacific, which was an existing railroad company in Sacramento, excuse me, to build the railroad and to meet. The, the initial act did not specify where they were going to meet. That said about sort of the great race. If you, you know, if there was a reality show in the 1860s, it was definitely the construction of the railroad. There was, they got paid for how much land that they graded. They got paid again for laying track once it was inspected. And so the grading race was tremendous to try to grade as much as possible. There's all these stories about how they got to Utah and they went way past each other and they didn't meet up. None of those are true. 
but they did grade past each other. And so as it became clear that the railroads were going to keep building as much railroad as they were allowed to build, they finally decided in Washington, well, we need to pick a point and say this is, this is the meeting spot. And so Promontory Summit, Utah was selected as the meeting spot. And on May 10, 1869, only seven years after the railroad was created, they drove the Golden Spike to complete the Transcontinental Railroad. There were, that was considered really the most important event of the day. It was probably the first internationally publicized event of the day because the spike that was driven was connected to the telegraph. So that when that hammer hit the spike and it hit the rail and it was driven in, it would send a message around the country and around the world that the railroad was done. Now the story is that Leland Stanford, he was on the Central Pacific, of course. The story is that Leland Stanford swung and missed. But when, he, when the spike hit the rail, it completed the circuit and the message was done. It's a great story. Nobody knows if it's true, but we all still tell it anyway. <laughs> there was a troop train right behind the 119 on the Union Pacific, headed from the east to the west. The first train across the Transcontinental Route, not surprisingly, was a, a train load of soldiers. Part of the arrangement with the government was that the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific would haul military and would haul mail at a much reduced rate in return for those land grants. And that continued up until the 1940s, through World War II, and up until the time that the mail finally moved off of the railroad. So for a hundred years nearly, Union Pacific and Central Pacific paid that debt to pay off those land grants. The time it took to get across the country went from about six months by wagon, or probably about three months around by boat, to about eight days. And what happened was you could, you could take your, your wife and kids. You could take your mother-in-law. You could take your wife's fine china so she'd actually go with you to the west. <laughs> you could take your prized steer and your bag of corn. You could take all of those things that you needed that you couldn't take on a wagon train. But people still had to be convinced that they needed to move out west. So what the railroad did, all of the railroads, not just Union Pacific, they sent recruiters. They were sent recruiters to Europe. And it was vital that the people who homesteaded, who came out to the west, were successful. So you didn't go to Italy to recruit from Minnesota. You didn't go to Norway to recruit for Texas. They sent their recruiters to places where there were farmers and ranchers who knew the kind of environment they were going to work in. So a lot of the ethnic distribution that was initially created in the United States was a result of the railroad recruiters that were sent out to do those recruiting. So the Czechs in Nebraska, the, the um, Norwegians in Minnesota, the Italians in Texas, a lot of those original distributions were set up because of the way the railroad did recruiting. Okay, I think I'm going to get off of the history here for a minute unless anybody has any questions. Yes? Don't forget the Irish. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the Irish. You know, the Irish built the railroad. They built the Union Pacific. The Union Pacific was built mostly by Civil War veterans. Um, but the Central Pacific had some more challenges. You know, when Civil War veterans were coming off of the line, the construction on the railroad didn't start in 1862. It didn't really start until 1865 after the war ended. Because there were no men, there were no materials, there was no money, there was no way to build a railroad. So when the war ended, men came off of the battlefield. And, you know, I like to think that they wanted to build something instead of destroying something for so many years. And so they came to the railroad. But there was no reason for them to go to California, to the Central Pacific. They came to the Union Pacific. Central Pacific was left with a gap. They didn't have men to build a railroad. And they had, frankly, a much harder task at the opening because they had to get through the Sierra Madre, Sierra Nevada, excuse me. They had to get through the Sierra Nevada mountains. They didn't have anybody to build it. Well, back in the 1830s and 1840s, Chinese had come to California for the gold rush. And the gold rush, as they do, sort of failed. It petered out, but the Chinese didn't go back. So Central Pacific was looking around saying, who can we possibly hire? And people said, well, you know, we got all these out-of-work Chinese. And of course the response was, they're too small, they don't work hard enough. No way. They didn't have any other choice. So they finally said, well, let's give it a try. 
Well, we all know what happened. Not only did they know how to use gunpowder and various forms of explosives, because they've been working with that for hundreds of years, they also like to drink tea, and they like to eat rice, and they like to eat vegetables, which the Irish didn't always like to do. <laughs> so, the, uh, the workforce on the Central Pacific was far healthier, and they had a much more dangerous job, and, and everyone knows that there were certainly deaths. No one knows how many, but there were certainly men who lost their lives in the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. But at the end, it was the Irish and the Chinese who, for in, in large part, built the railroad. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I remember a phrase that uh, they tried to build a mile a day, or they got a mile a day at some point. Did those tracks have to be rebuilt because the work wasn't, uh, shall we say, up to standards? Actually, they built 10 miles oh. in one day. 10 miles in one day. Um, and yes, they had to replace the track. Part of it was because they were using cottonwood. They were using whatever trees they could get. That was Union Pacific's problem. There were no trees left. You know, I think maybe Nebraska was a great forest until the Union Pacific got there. <laughs> <laughs> they used every cottonwood that was available. Um, and then they had to get supplies. So they had train loads of supplies coming behind them. And they were dependent on the supplies in order to construct the railroad. They moved fast. Um, but the railroad was inspected by, uh, by officials from Washington before they were allowed to get paid. So they had to build a railroad that was up to par. It was not, it, it could carry what it needed to carry. On the Union Pacific part, how much uh, mechanical steam shovels and that were used versus hand labor? You know, we have a, a, a wonderful photo archive in Council Bluffs, and I will echo Kathy's comment about you really should go see the museum. Um, the photo archives show men with wheelbarrows, but they also show steam shovels on the back of these train loads of equipment. So I think they, they had equipment that they could use to get through, but there was a lot of hand labor going on as well. Does anyone know what the weight of the rail, the original rail was on the railroad, the 25 pound rail? Anybody? Does anyone know? Otherwise, I'm going to make it up. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. I think it was probably in the 40s. I think the weight of the rail was in the 40s. Okay, I'm going to move on then. So, fast forward 75 years. Um, I always tell people that the railroad industry. You know, it was really the first <coughs> corporate industry in the United States. Um, it was the first it, first endeavor that was built by private investment. Um, the first endeavor that was a national effort that was a public-private partnership. Um, it was unionized early. It was, a, we created some of the first health care system. We had uh, railroad retirement before there was Social Security. We did everything wrong before anybody else had the opportunity to do it. So the railroads as an industry was very tightly regulated. There were a lot of reasons for that but it became a stranglehold on the railroad industry. There, were no, there was no room left for the rail industry to do what it needed to do to move into the modern era. And many of you may remember, in the 60s and 70s, there would be standing derailments. A car would be sitting on the track, and the track would just go out from underneath it. Railroads were going bankrupt at a really alarming rate. And Washington said, you know, we need to deal with this, or we're not going to have a railroad industry left. And so in 1980, the Staggers Act was passed. And the Staggers Act essentially said, railroads are businesses, and they need to be able to function as businesses. They need to be regulated because they serve the, the national good, but they need to be able to, to manage their business in a way that will allow them to survive. And you can see from this chart what happened after the Staggers Act was passed. Productivity increased dramatically. The volume increased. Revenue actually went down. Although with productivity and volume up, it's still good. We still were making money. And the price went down. So if you were shipping a carload of goods in 1980, you ship the same carload of goods now, it would cost you less in adjusted dollars. So it was a tremendous saving grace for the rail industry. 
and it set us on a path for the future. Now there are seven large railroads left in the country. There are four major railroads, two in the east and two in the west. The CSX and the Norfolk Southern in the east, the BNSF and the Union Pacific in the west. By most measures, Union Pacific is the largest of all the railroads. Altogether, there are another 23 regional railroads. The Iowa Interstate would be an example of a regional railroad operates in more than one state. There's lots of short lines, too many to list, but the Iowa Northern would be an example. The Boone and Scenic Valley is a short line, so we're all freight. There are lots and lots of railroads left, but only seven major railroads left. The other three are the KCS, the uh, Canadian Pacific, and the Canadian National. 180,000 miles, you see the freight cars, total number of employees. That $12 billion invested in 2011 is in capital. I'm going to talk a lot more about that. It is privately owned. We are taxed as a private uh, corporation. And generally speaking, we're not government subsidized. And what that means is we do all of our own business without government subsidy. But where there is a project that the government has asked us to undertake, high-speed rail being an example, the government typically pays for their portion of the investment. So there are folks who give a lot of thought to what does the railroad get out of this and what does the public get out of this, and they divvy up the cost. But generally speaking, there's no government subsidy. Union Pacific, as I said, is the largest by most measures. You can see the, the various statistics up there, about 45,000 employees, 25,000 customers. We have access to all of the um, interchanges with the, with the Mexican border, and we have access with all, all of the West Coast ports and also New Orleans and Houston. And in Iowa, we're the largest railroad in Iowa. Iowa's very unique, and Peggy Bear in the back of the room is one of the reasons why. Because Iowa re recognized in the 70s and 80s that if they lost their railroads, they would lose a lot of their economic development potential. And so the Iowa DOT stepped in and took action to make sure that a lot of the routes were protected. This is the original Chicago Northwestern route, and this is the piece that Union Pacific acquired with its merger through Chicago Northwestern. This, it gets very complicated, and I'm going to be wrong, and there are people in the room who know more than I do, but the Rock Island, the um, Minneapolis and St. Paul, a lot of different conglomerates came into creating what you see here as a modern Union Pacific. But this is the part I want to draw your attention to. If you look at a map of Union Pacific, you see this here in Iowa? You see it anyplace else? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really exist anyplace else. All of these small feeder lines were cut off and given to short lines, except in Iowa. And that's one of the reasons why ethanol, obviously it's a corn state, that makes a big difference, but it's one of the reasons why ethanol was able to pick up so fast in Iowa, because they had the infrastructure in place. Somebody was asking me before we started about the trains that go north-south through Ames. Lots of tank cars, lots of ethanol, biodiesel. One of the reasons is because this was there ready to serve those plants. So you can see, as of last year, um, annual payroll, in-state purchases, community giving, a uh, number of employees. So Union Pacific's investment in the state of Iowa is substantial, as you can see. Question? Yes. What did the state uh, do to induce the uh, UP to maintain those roads? Well, they didn't belong to the UP at the time. And I would have to defer to Peggy again. I don't know that she's ready to come up here to talk about it, because it's very complicated. But the state engaged with some funds to try to protect railroads that were struggling in the 70s and 80s so that they would be available and would be viable when a railroad like Union Pacific came along and acquired the lines. Is that fair? Yeah, it's, and it's on the banner over there. And you can read the banner. <laughs> what, what's the dotted line on your map? A uh, dotted line means that's where we operate over uh, trackage rights or another uh, railroad operates over trackage rights. I was, um, the Iowa Northern operates over that. Okay, so I'm going to kind of move into what we do now. Um, one of the things that we're most proud of is our environmental record. We are three times cleaner than trucks. 
and four times more fuel efficient. We haul one ton of freight, 480 miles on a gallon of diesel fuel. I mean, if you think about that, you think about the weight of your car and how far you could go if you were getting that kind of mileage, you wouldn't be stopping at the, at the gas pump very often. Uh, we take about 300, one train, depending on what it's hauling, takes about 300 trucks off the highway. So if 10% of long distance truck traffic were diverted to rail, it would be the equivalent of taking about 2 million cars off of the highway. And in Iowa specifically, it takes about half a million trucks to move the same amount of grain that just originated in Iowa and is hauled by rail. So if all of a sudden the railroads disappeared, there would be half a million more trucks on the highway just to haul the grain out. That doesn't count the coal that comes in, the fertilizer, all the other things that come into Iowa. So you may not, well, in Ames you see your share of trains. You don't, you know, they're not part of everyday life anymore, as far as people know. But in fact, they are very much a part of everyday life. If they weren't here, you would notice their absence. I want to draw your attention to this, too. Um, freight railroads haul 43% of the freight based on tonnage. You know, we haul heavy stuff. We produce just over 9% of the greenhouse gas emissions. Now part of that is because once we get rolling, we don't, it doesn't take a whole lot to keep a train going, as opposed to delivering on city streets. But if you look at 43% of the freight, freight and own less than 10% of the greenhouse gas emissions, and you start thinking about how does the rail industry figure into the future of this country, it figures pretty substantially. This is another interesting statistic from the 1980s. We haul double freight on the same amount of fuel. So we are using the same amount of fuel in gallons that we used in the 1980s to haul twice as much volume. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, we have a lot of employees who have um, patents because of things that they've come up with. Uh, coal. Coal cars are basically tin cans. If you see a derailment from a coal train, you see these crumpled cars because they're very lightweight so that the weight goes into the coal that can be hauled. So we haul a lot more coal. You'll see very long trains, which is not always fun when you're sitting at a crossing. But what comes from that is we use a lot less fuel. It's far more efficient to haul longer trains than to haul multiple trains. We've done some amazing things with locomotives in terms of we have essentially a Toyota Prius, except it's a whole lot bigger, where we use a, 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 a type of engine that will allow us to use the electricity more efficiently. There was a question in back. Uh, I've noticed in the last few years that um, I'll see, you know, these crates that come through Ames, a, uh, a locomotive at the end, or occasionally one in the middle as well. Um, what, has, what has changed in terms of the technology to allow the Union Pacific Railroads to do that? Why do we use multiple locomotives throughout the train? You know, a lot of it is just really smart people who figure this out. It's called distributed power, and it allows us to, um, to get better fuel efficiency, but also not to pull a train apart. As trains get longer and longer, of course, the, the, the tension on those knuckles between cars becomes greater and greater. And so you need to have something distributing the power within the train so that you can make sure that you're pull, you have the same pulling force. So there's, there's locomotives at the front, in the middle, and sometimes at the back, depending on the weight of the load that you're hauling. On the slide before this, the, on the graph, what is other freight? Uh, barge, uh, airplane, um, any other, you know, uh, panel truck, anything else that hauls freight. Okay, and I already talked a little bit about less pollution in terms of emissions per mile. We're essentially the lowest in all categories except for particulate matter and air. Of course, air is not a very efficient way to haul freight. And we also support a lot of energy alternatives. Um, that I mentioned that that initial picture that you saw was um, turbines for uh, or blades for wind turbines. You see here we also haul um, uranium. We get into the nuclear. There's you know. Nobody likes to think about nuclear waste going through their community. But railroads are far, far more safe as a means of hauling